Welcome to Cookies, the world's most influential basketball podcast. I am Ben Dietrich. Jordan Ridelli is on vacation. And Andrew Quo, stop me, you've heard this before, he takes no days off. Mr. Quo, how are you today? Pretty incredible, man. I feel great. Mm. The, the beaches are open in New York. Uh, we got over the mountain. Uh, uh, direct quote from our governor and uh no man i feel good i'm I'm powering through this this core man how you feeling so you're saying it's smooth sailing (laughs) in multiple ways literally and figuratively coasting i'm sitting on my skateboard i'm going downhill it all is good man are you a beach guy i've never thought of you as a beach guy but now i'm reconsidering no i've been to the beach a couple times in my life it to me, feels like uh, the afternoon going away for nothing. All right, I'm going to rephrase that. You hate beaches. I don't hate beaches, but if someone asked me to go, I would not go. <laughs> I got to be honest with you. It sounds quite a bit like something a person who hates beaches would say. Hate is different than opting out. If you said you were going to the beach, I'd be like, cool, have fun, man. That sounds great. That's not hate. If you asked me if I wanted to go, I'd be like, no, I'm going to take, I'm going to sit this one out, man. I'm going to take this day off. So you, you're ambivalent. No, you're not ambivalent. I I mean, I have been to the beach, but I, given the choice, I would do something else. All right. I'm going to say you hate the beach. (laughs) And and I want to know why. What do you hate about the beach? Is it the sun, the surf? The sand? Which of those words beginning with an S rubs you the wrong way the worst? Well, I I don't really love swimming. I'm not good at it. I've never been drawn to the water. It's beautiful. I mean, I love going to, like, looking at it when I'm there. I'm not mad. Um, But to me... You sound sound mad at the beach. I'm just being honest. Well, opting out is different than being mad. So if I'm... Look, look. I've had it with your rhetorical (laughs) gambit. You're a beach hater. And yet... You love sardines. Hmm. Ironic. <laughs> well, you love giving people titles like kings and beach haters, but like uh, <laughs> this is like a nothing burger because I love to like, let's say there was something to do, like go see a band on the beach. Sure. So hmm. I like, I don't like when there's nothing to do. So if there's no plan except to swim and lie around, I will probably like walk around Manhattan instead, you know? Um, but if someone's like, oh, I'm having a barbecue or my friend's band is playing in Coney Island or something, I'll be like, I'll check that out. Or my friend is having like a, a birthday party. I'm like, all right. I don't love the beach for a couple mm-hmm. reasons, but I, but I still enjoy a, a good beach day every now and then. I don't love the fact that my alabaster flesh <laughs> burns mm-hmm. immediately. Don't mm-hmm. love that. Not, not, not huge into that. But my biggest problem with the beach in New York is getting back from Oh, my it. God. That, to me, is the, the real issue. It is a slog. If man. you're taking the train, it kind of nullifies all the cleansing and, you know, restoring effects of a trip to the beach and the quasi-relaxation you could have picked up on public transportation. Or if you're in a car, it takes like an hour and you're stuck in traffic or it's an expensive ride back. The returning from the beach to me is by far the major problem. If you could just walk to the beach and then walk home in a matter of minutes, I'd be at the beach all the time. Yeah, man. That's why I don't know Sinbin. I don't like to go to baseball games because getting back is so excruciating. Um, a question beach-wise, is beach tired a unique tired I have never been more exhausted doing anything than like a day at the beach by the time I get home I feel wiped and I'm like all I did was sit in the sun and I know that takes energy but holy moly dude I don't know I always swim so I attribute it to that but it could be the sun as well Um, I the the going 
traveling back from places, whether it be going to Portugal or Asia or the beach or even the movies, like deters me from doing so much. I am quintessentially New York that way. Coming back from Queens after a baseball game, intolerable. It sucks, man, especially when it's crowded on the subway. I mean, I don't know how we're going to do this post-core, but even like going to Flushing for food and coming back on either a Chinatown bus or the subway sucks, man. Astoria? Are you kidding? (laughs) How does anyone get that? (laughs) Might as well be the moon. Um. Like, yes, I would like to eat some sardines over a sink in Astoria on a sunny day, like a good Greek. I Can't get there. It's impossible. Well, I mean, getting there is the anticipation is it, it floats me a little bit. Coming back, the anticipation of leaving or the, the act of leaving is less enticing. I have a couple of buddies who moved to the beach, though. Do you have any friends that did that? Yeah, I know a few people who are out in the Rockaways. Yeah. Like the little bungalow life, but they're all surfers. Mm. I a couple of skate buddies moved out there, and my buddy, my boxing buddy, who I watch all my boxing matches with, moved out there, and uh, they love it, man. I'm kind of into the idea now that you're mentioning it. I wonder what it's like now. Have they s- is real estate plunging or soaring? I have no it idea. It was soaring before the core, and we don't know what the effect of the core will have on real estate. So far, not huge because everyone's just pulling property instead of selling it low but he was saying it was soaring but the prices were still laughably low so soaring in what context right like when nate robinson wins a slam dunk competition he's soaring but could you be convinced to buying a bungalow and just totally rebranding as a beach guy the Cookies Hoops Bungalow? Yes, I could be convinced of that. <laughs> you just convinced me. <laughs> um, yeah, and that'll be a place where all the Patreon <laughs> subscribers can come and hang out with Quo. <laughs> where I take no days <laughs> off from the beach. Um, just, just to mention that briefly, thank you to everybody who has already signed up for the Cookies Hoops Patreon. We are very appreciative of your support. And if you have not signed up, keep in mind that you are hearing this pod three days late and you would be getting instant access like all of our beloved subscribers get, along with some discounts on products and first crack at all that tsunami wave drip. (laughs) The kind of stuff you need a beach bungalow for. Yeah, man, this process is never totally easy, but we appreciate the support that came out off the bat and you know hopefully we made a good value man we're gonna try to pod twice a week if not more when there's breaking Knicks news Um, and for five dollars at the minimum entry level starter membership you get all those pods right off the bat emergencies included yeah it's like a it's like a Dwayne Deadman 10 day contract with the Sixers and then if you want to step your way up to like the Atlantic Hawks Deadman contract (laughs) and then if you're like really balling then you can get to the masterpiece the Sacramento Kings Dwayne Deadman contract (laughs) but um yeah to your point if people don't have five bucks to spare totally Mm -hmm. understandable and you can check out the pod and get it a few yeah we're still gonna give you every pod just a couple days later um and it's still free but yes If you got that five bucks, you know where to send it. The Quo Bungalow Ooh, yeah. So at the bungalow, we're going to have large screen TVs, all the frozen pizzas with all the the different brands on on deck, and um, maybe I'll fire up the barbecue. Um, Mm. I will not be at the water, but if you want to go surfing and you come back, I will have uh, frozen drinks for you. I've already been to Mm. your bungalow. In a parallel universe where time is running the other direction. Oh, so like instead of the clutch gene at the end, it's the clutch gene in the beginning. (laughs) (laughs) That first quarter, they say the games are decided in the first five minutes. 
<laughs> I don't know how they play these basketball <laughs> games backwards. I don't know how you watch the end of games, man. All you have to do is watch the first three minutes. <laughs> no, no, no. I want to see how it started. <laughs> All right, I can turn it off now. <laughs> so the, you can do a better job explaining this than I can, I would presume, because I don't understand it at all. But apparently scientists identified a Norino, I believe they're called, and it was traveling the wrong direction, which immediately indicated that there is a parallel universe to our spinning the other direction. Is that, is that the uh, explanation? Kind of. I mean, these things are so nebulous, but it's one of those great theories that has no disproof, therefore it has to have validity. So in a nutshell, with a bunch of balloons, they figured out, like, they've always wondered where dark matter goes, and this is the whole Stephen Hawking thing and black holes and science fiction movies and Star Trek and all that stuff. If there's negative or if there's nothing energy and if... Einstein was kind of right about something. It would be like there's an equal and opposite reaction to everything in the universe. Right. And this goes back to the Big Bang Mm -hmm. theory where there was an equal amount of matter and antimatter and they collided and created these energy bursts. But the matter that went and formed our universe is counteracted by antimatter that is floating. Yeah. And our... but no one really knows where yeah, it went. Yeah, and I love this whole idea because it is less self-centered as human beings. I know Magellan existed in everything, but I think the idea, if we accept the Big Bang and it created our universe, then there's a possibility that it created other stuff and just not us. And it flies against the face of maybe some certain religions or the way we think as human beings, because we have to, because if we, <laughs> we talked about that this week. Things that we would find out would destroy our, our simple minds and like crush us and things would we would burn things and not act in a civil way. I, I, no, of course. And like the basketball comparison would be people understanding them. <laughs> a lot of that would just their minds would explode. The, the bungalow and, would be torched, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, you know, people can't fathom it. It's like. You know, it's like trying to describe this theory to me. (laughs) I mean, and to me as well. So basically, there's evidence that there could be another universe outside our own, which I think is probably a definite yes, but it's hard to prove. And this universe involves time operating on a different premise than the way we think time operates. And it could be reverse if the theory of... Equal and opposite is true. Now, what would that mean for, say, me? Would you be watching Allen Iverson slip through your fingers, but at the same career rate, um, but he would be getting younger and younger, and soon you're going to have to deal with, like, Charles Barkley as a player, which is pretty great. Um, mm. yeah, that's Dr. Okay. J that's is okay. awesome. Mo Cheeks. But, but overall, this strikes me as the kind of theory that I can support because it requires that I do nothing. Mm -hmm. I don't have to shift my behavior. I don't have to contemplate anything on a daily basis. I can just sort of nod at it. Like, yeah, totally, man. Alternate universe. That's wild. (laughs) This is a simulation of, of course it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're blue pilling it, man. You want that steak. You want to eat that steak and not think about it, right? And I, yo, I'm kind of with you too. I kind of want to blue pill my life. Well, what I'm saying is it's too big for me to even address. Even if I sit there and say, all right, I've, I've come to the conclusion that there is absolutely a parallel universe spinning backwards in time <laughs> where the sardines are coming up into quotes mm-hmm, tin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can't do anything about mm-hmm. it. I, I, have no, I have no next move. Checkmate universe. This is the challenge with quarantine and COVID-19, right? Because COVID-19 is a pretty simple thing. It's a virus and we know how it behaves and it's deadly and it has stopped our society in its tracks and it's important not to take the red pill (laughs) willy-nilly because we're sitting here contemplating all these things. It's like, oh, the NBA just is a construct, right? Or Ben Simmons doesn't exist until he plays games. Uh, there is no Friday Night Lights anymore, right? Like, all of this doesn't matter. The alternate 
the alternate universe is about to not have COVID. <laughs> yeah, but then get get the Spanish flu <laughs> and uh, the Black Plague. Oh, that that's gonna suck, man. <laughs> but they've already seen what we go through, so touche, alternate universe. They see Ben Simmons winning MVPs could, already. Right. If you could get to that alternate universe, you could kind of biff it <laughs> and, and make a lot of good wages <laughs> going forward. Make a couple of G's, my, my G. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm going to turn this knowledge into betting on basketball games. <laughs> there was that one study that they asked uh, a bunch of people what they would do if they would go if they could go back in time with the knowledge that they know now and like and a, a large number of people said to kill hitler <laughs> which i think is the most amazing answer because it's rooted in like goodness but also just like a, a misunderstanding of what how humans live life I do like it though. Like, yeah, I'm gonna go back in time and I'm gonna find baby Hitler and kill the baby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How are you gonna kill the baby? Oh man, I don't know. I mean, I'll drown the baby. He might bash its brains in. Like, dude, you're talking about a baby. I know, but it's baby Hitler. <laughs> which is which is precog, which is a whole different sci-fi thing starring Tom Cruise. I'm gonna tor- I'm gonna well, I'm gonna torture the baby for what yeah, he does yeah. later. <laughs> Make him well, really. I'm gonna pay. let the world know what Hitler ends up doing. I'm like, oh, will you? Yeah, because like no one tried to do that. <laughs> Cool, man. How many followers on Twitter do you have in 1940-something? Well, I announced to everyone that Hitler was going to take over the globe and, you know, commit mass murder and inadvertently led him to taking over the globe and committing mass murder. Yeah, exactly. It's like, (laughs) are you Hitler? (laughs) Um, You said something about steaks. You mean like de la sol steaks or eating steaks? Mm, Eating steaks. What's it? That made me made me think of Peter Luger, who has started doing delivery. <laughs> There's something yeah. funny about that. Like, I'll take this eighty dollars steak in a styrofoam container, please, to eat on my couch. Over the sink, over the sink, man. <laughs> Jesus, have we ne- have you learned nothing? I had an orange yesterday, and it was like leaking a lot of there orange juice which is where the the juice comes from. And I almost went over the sink and I couldn't. (laughs) I was like, no, I can't do this. I have to be strong. So instead, I let the drippings go all over a a cutting board and my hands and the floor and my shirt. Then I washed all the things off individually. So like I made a prideful decision to avoid eating over the sink, but I don't know if if it might have cost me. Where did the water come from to wash the, the, the table and the cutting board? Man, I ended up over there. Anyway. <laughs> I mean, having a watermelon like in the in August when you buy a whole ass watermelon, the sink is golden, man. It's what it was. It's a watermelon plate. Oh, you're hungry. Imagine having a drain on a, a serving plate. It's just like somewhere you could put like scraps into. Like, oh man, imagine if you could even flush it. <laughs> imagine if you could poop. While eating a Peter Luger steak. All right, all right, all right, all right. That's that's what happened with MJ's <laughs> pizza. What... But is there a ceiling on the quality of food that you will order? Is it a price point? Is it is it based on like would you order a Luger steak for fun? If I was rich, sure. There's no way that steak is as good as it would be allegedly at Peter Luger's. We know. Maybe it's a little suspect these days, but um, I, I thought about this a lot because I was craving sushi and now omakase places are doing omakase prices for takeout sushi, which I think is hilarious. It's good fish. I mean, it's expensive and meat should be expensive, but would I eat a Peter Luger steak from a styrofoam container? Yes, I would. Hmm. I don't have a problem with that, but there is diminishing 100%, returns. Yeah, I got a uh, pickup from Ada, which is a really fantastic Indian restaurant in Queens. And uh, this is not to denigrate hmm. their fantastic food, but when you're eating stuff out of a, a container or even putting on a plate at your house, it just hits different. Totally different, man. And you're like, why am I not eating a $9 thing of pad thai and calling it a day? Like, I'm just shoveling junk from a tray into my mouth for sustenance. You can't really enjoy 
a meal in the same way when it's takeout. That's a fundamental flaw. Like Gordon Hayward and the gamers of the world, they're really flourishing and growing during the core. And certain foods operate the same way, right? Like, man, frozen pizza is having a moment in the core. <laughs> it, that's not true, right? That's just <laughs> Okay, so I tried my first DiGiorno pizza. <laughs> it was slamming. <laughs> Oh, no. Uh, what's ha- what, what's happening? I mean, I'm you? not opposed to frozen pizza. I will buy a whole pizza from Scars and freeze half of it. Do you do that? Hmm. No, but I respect it. You heat it. it up in a pan on medium-low heat. It takes like 15 minutes, a while, but do something else, and it's like amazing, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get that double crispy Ooh, crust. Fire. But uh, I think I think these restaurants have to shoot their shot. If you talk to Peter Luger, even though it's Peter Luger, they might be like, we have like two months in the bank before we have to consider like going bankrupt or maybe closing or firing people. So we're just going to try to sell these subpar steaks. I am not mad at them for attempting it. And I understand why all these places are doing it. And I'm appreciative that they are because I want access to their food, even if it's less than ideal. I want them to survive. For my own selfish reasons, even beyond the natural, you know, hope for everyone to survive this shit. Um, but yeah, like Ada, the food was totally good. Really enjoyed it. But when you're not in a restaurant, when you're not getting it in the confines of even being, you know, presented and plated in a certain order and, and that environment... It's tough, man. Yeah, I think about drinks most in that sense. In in New York City, a lot of bars and restaurants are doing to-go cocktails and uh, even selling beers. And you can drink in front or you can take them to go like a liquor store. But it it's different because having a cocktail sitting down in a beautifully designed or even like a medium designed restaurant is a different experience than walking away with like a nice paper cup and a cool cocktail i'm like i don't want it anymore i want to sit in your restaurant (laughs) i don't want this cocktail i want to be in your spot you know yeah and and again this is all common knowledge we know that the environment is part of the charm we know that the service and the expertise that restaurants have are the reason that it's so enjoyable being there and I actually encourage people to keep ordering yeah. from these spots. It is just, it's just yeah. different. And it is the things that make you miss our normalcy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like, as you said, it's sitting in a restaurant. It's not necessarily their mm-hmm. food. And it's being with your friends, shutting down a restaurant, little half moons of wine stains all over the tablecloth. That's what we're missing. It's not necessarily the Luger steak yes, itself. Right. And like Danny Meyer, who, you know, does Shake Shack and 11 Madison or used to no never did 11 Madison but he he's one of like the restaurateur that like de Blasio calls when he wants to reopen he's the guy and in his book he doesn't say he loves food he says he loves restaurants like when I was when he was struggling to find out what he wanted to do with his life he realized the most enjoyable part of his his life was going to restaurants and not necessarily the food itself and i think when david chang announces that he's closing nishi and moving uh, sambar to the south street seaport near our buddies at espn i think there's a sadness there for me because it's a part of new york city that was huge in the last 10 12 13 years and to have it kind of uh like float away in the ether is it's very frustrating <laughs> it's like we didn't have a shot like we didn't even have we couldn't even take that shot on the other hand the food is about to be so good in the parallel universe i'm, I'm just it's gonna fill up my plate as i sit there in the parallel universe they're like you can sit inside restaurants <laughs> yes what? We thought you had to take it home in styrofoam cartons. But you get your check right off the bat, so that kind of sucks. You have to tip as soon as you walk in. <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah, know I, don't know. I don't know. As soon as you walk out? I don't know. Do you just go into the restaurants and start vomiting up the food? Oh, man, it's, it's, there's, it's a real snap. You've got to eat your Luger say quick because it gets bloodier and bloodier as it sits there. It just becomes a cow by the yeah. end of your meal. 
Um, yeah, there's a lot of problems with this parallel. Have universe. you been? You know, we've been on this this eating meat thing for years now. Have you been eating more or less meat in the core? I eat less because I cook most mm. of my meals, and I find meat slightly unforgiving in terms of my own concern about whether it's still good. Hmm. And because I'll get stuff and I'll freeze it, and then when you take it out, and then you're kind of losing track. Like, when did I get that out? Because the date is no is mm-hmm. meaningless now. Mm-hmm. So you've got a whole chicken that's been in your fridge for months. You unfreeze it. Now it's, what, five days old? And you look at it like, okay, March. Uh, it gets confusing. Hmm. Yeah, so sticking with mostly vegetables to cook has been much easier and I think less wasteful. Mm-hmm. I yeah. Although vegetables get wasteful too. Yeah, they turn real fast. Um, I just throw salt and vinegar on them as soon as they start start turning. But yeah, I there was some part of my brain when this started that said if I don't take care of like my brain, then I'm done for. So I was like I need to provide little like incentives for myself in the core and to me that was like a treat like ooh, i'm gonna buy dumplings or a steak you know and then that'll make me happy because that's peak delicious but it's kind of running out for me and i don't know if i think people's taste buds change as they get older but meat doesn't hit the same anymore for me Hmm. we've talked about this yeah i mean thinking about where we are in the progression of this and how we all kind of collectively started cooking everything and now more restaurants are opening. It's not quite as like little house on the prairie where it's like, where's your sourdough yeah. starter? Where's your bread? It's like, we're starting to kind of figure out regular life and getting food yeah. from places like um, our buddies, uh, Lucien, who's a, French restaurant on the Lower East Side, who is a member of the Cookies Hoops Classic. I know they just started opening for uh, takeout and delivery. And it, this is happening week after week, day after day. And places are, are kind of sticking their head out and saying, all right, we got to sort of sort yeah. things. And I, my urge is to support them mm-hmm. and to order food from my friends' places or go and pick up from them. So... I find myself just cooking a lot less over the last like, yeah. couple of weeks. Yeah, and you, yeah, you realize it's not necessary to like cook up a meal every time you're hungry. There's ways to eat. And supermarkets are still the scariest place. Scary. So, yeah. They're the, they're the only scary place at so this I kinda point. I kind of want to... I mean, not really, but you know. Yeah, I wanted to bring this up to you. And like, you know, at 7 o'clock every day, people applaud, you know, our first response. Uh community uh, nurses doctors hospitals emergency workers like totally i'm into that right a part of it kind of like i wanted to discuss this i wanted to workshop this because at seven o'clock when i hear the applause my reaction is kind of like shout out to the food supply people who like deliver food to us because that has not been an issue during the core and i'm so grateful <laughs> because what do they say like you miss four meals and then society breaks down at that point we have not had to deal with that and we could still get vegetables and restaurants could still order food and people have to people are getting sick in these processing places and yet we still have food so like is it okay to think of first responders and hospitals as you know however like boston strong stuff houston strong stuff Absolutely, 100%. Is there room for more people? You know, the the 7 o'clock clapping was originally for... It wasn't necessarily first responders exactly, right? It was for kind of like hospital That's kind of what I meant. Uh, yeah, that's the wrong word for right. it. No, I know, I yeah. know. I'm just saying, yeah. And then there was also kind of crossover, like, oh, I can cops, I guess, and yeah. firemen, ambulances, uh, sure. At this point, I think it's just become kind of a civic applause. Yes. Like, it's 7 o'clock. Like, make some noise. I'll be honest. I don't love it. I'm not mad. I'm not annoyed that people are doing it. But it's not necessarily for me, I 
like, hey, you know, I'll stick my head out the window and clap a little bit. If I'm on the street, you, you know, you're caught. You have to clap. Yeah, I'm fine with that. But it's for people who want to do that, and, and that's important to them, and that's cool. But I think it can be totally applicable to just New York. It's New Yorkers who are stuck inside clapping to be like, hey, New York yeah. is still here. I'm still here. I exist. Yeah. I'm not on the street, but I'm, I'm around. And I think that's all it is, like a, a, just a gesture of it's like doing yeah. the wave. Hey, we're all in the stadium together. I mean, it really helps us during the core to create stories. And like I remember 9-11, we had the whole like police department, fire department things. And like the New York Mets wore fire department and police department hats during a game. And I'm like, it was, it was confusing to me because I grew up fearing the cops <laughs> and then all of a sudden they were heroes but i'm not sure why because we got our asses handed to us during 9 11 and and that's like maybe it's the reverberations of that i mean new york city got knocked out we we took the l and i'm happy to be on the opposite side of this but we lost too many people and uh, yeah, I mean, we didn't lose them. They they fucking died, you know? Like, people died in mass here. So applauding it, I, I love it for a civil uh, civic reason, like you say. But it's, like, a little too sad. And then I get it turns into a little bit of resentment in me because the mentality of, like, New York Strong kind of reminds me of the New York Mets wearing those hats, you know? I'm like... Is that what we mean? But then it quickly becomes like, let's just be chill about this. <laughs> like, just do this. What what annoys me about it is that it's kind of like an alarm. Mm. Where if you're looking at your, you know, your phone or a clock, whatever, you're like, oh, 657. <laughs> All right, uh, all right, all right, yeah. here we go. Hey! Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it just becomes this thing like you just know it's going to happen. It's very weird. In that mm-hmm. way, it's it's like knowing, yeah, it's like yeah. an alarm. I mean, yeah. So I have a weird dread yeah. of it in that way that I know this sound is coming and I, <laughs> I can't stop it. It's going <laughs> to happen. But yeah, symbolically, I have no issues. Yeah, it's it. cool. I mean, I'm just nitpicking, but there is, there is a tinge of like uh, expressing fear and creating fear that I feel every seven o'clock. Where, you know, we are expressing our, like, an abstract idea being like, you know, the people addressing this head on as a not abstract idea need to be acknowledged because I don't want to do that. And also reminding us that this thing is huge. (laughs) Up until last week, I saw the the Empire State Building was still doing like a, a pulsing red color scheme oh yeah sort of look like an emergency flare i don't know if they're still doing it because last night it was it was blue and white and kind of like Mm -hmm. sparkling and you know it it was definitely different so Mm -hmm. i'm wondering if they've said okay we're not doing like the scary beacon Mm -hmm. anymore because things are better or it was just a temporary thing no idea but that was a really creepy image though every time you saw the the empire state building just like this red Eye of Sauron <laughs> pulsing over the city. It was actually really like terrifying. It's, it was Resident Evil stuff, man. Um, and yeah, and not to get too stony into this, but like, <laughs> do it. This is what like Cuomo and the news and the media are doing. They they have this red flashing light above our heads constantly, and like training ourselves to realize that this is just people interpreting information incorrectly and then sp- telling us how their interpretation works is like not actually what's happening. And, you know, uh, what was happening on the ground when those red Empire State Building lights went up was horrific. And then the lights are just red. And I'm just like, I just can't think about these red lights, <laughs> you know, but symbols mean a lot and clapping means a lot. And it's hard to differentiate art from actuality, right? Right. And it is important to remember that a lot of people Dude. died. And they died in terrible ways, painful, away from their loved ones, and largely invisibly. Mm-hmm. That's not to say that their loss is not tangible and people's feelings for them are not um, you know, incredibly meaningful and real. 
But to most people, these deaths occurred out of sight. Mm-hmm. You know, it was not 9-11, as you described earlier, where we s- literally saw the buildings come down and knew there were people yeah. in them. These are, um, it's almost in the way of like, you know, Pinochet. People were disappeared. Yes, right, right. A, an ambulance came and they were gone and you never yeah. saw them again. And it's, it's a different style of tragedy than watching two towers mm-hmm. come to the ground. I uh, I tuned into the streaming, <laughs> the, the streaming Twitter thing. I guess it was on multiple platforms of celebrities reading uh, people's names who have died of Corona. It's crazy. Like I turned it on. I think I forget who was reading. Um, one of the Coyote Ugly actors, Piper Parabu. She was just reading names, and it was like incredibly heavy. I only think I, I survived like four minutes and I had to tune out. It was too much. But. Um, yeah, I mean, when, when this has been quelled, let's build a statue. Yep. Well, let's do a memorial. Sure. Because 9-11 got a memorial. A huge one. Let's, let's give one to the, the you know, New York City residents who died of coronavirus. Like, let's do the same that thing. That 9-11 memorial is incredible. That thing was like really well thought out. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's one of like the I'm into all kind of memorials. And even when they miss, I'm like, they tried, you know, but the the one in New York City is incredible because it's the exact dimensions of one of the towers with the water flowing into it, sort of like a, a multiverse of things going in reverse. So it's like a relief of an architectural thing. It's almost a, a giant sink. Yeah, I would not recommend eating sardines over it. I think someone might say something, but you could do it at your home. I can't believe you did that. <laughs> yeah, w- not cool, Quo. <laughs> um, but yeah, when this is all over, we'll see what we want to do. But- mm, yeah, yeah. Andrew got canceled. <laughs> For- Why? I. I t- he ate sardines over the 9 11 I would take the sardine over the sink bullet, but it's funny how you're forgetting that your friend <laughs> ate a tuna fish salad over the toilet. Yet no mention. It I sounds racist to me. <laughs> I haven't I haven't forgotten. That. <laughs> hmm. One of us is white and one of us is not white. <laughs> wow, I just got well, I just got Alice and Roman. Yeah. Ugh. Um in other news. Cory Booker has announced mm. his five favorite rappers. Wow. Jay-Z. Chance, the rapper. Talib Kweli. <laughs> Common. Once known as Common Sense. And Queen Latifah. Wow. See, the Queen Latifah thing was a curveball. Respect, Cory. Was it? Or was it a twofer? Go on. He, he got a, a woman rapper... Also one from New Jersey. Yeah, that's true. The New Jersey thing. We are talking about the New Jersey yeah. senator here. Yeah, that's true. But then Chance the Rapper, what is he doing? That's some <laughs> that's some last dance omission shit. I mean, that's a bad that's list. That's a very bad list. And like, okay, you have a point with Queen Latifah. But like, Cardi B works better here, right? Even though she's not from New Jersey. If you wanted to go Jersey, I mean, Rotten Rascals all day. <laughs> Where was Lil' Kim from? Oh, Brooklyn, that's right, Biggie. My bad. Um, I, I Are boomers so excited just to talk about 90s <laughs> rap that this list works? It's, it's so weird, man. I feel like it's just the handshake meme with, like, the last dance. <laughs> D-nice parties <laughs> and Cory Booker's <laughs> list of rappers just, like, a, a triangle of fist. Points. I have an insatiable appetite for lists, and I love a bad list. But this list wasn't even funny bad; it was like common and chance a rapper. Also, if you're going to leave Quale and Common, you're covering the same ground, right? Like there, it, you're not, you're not. It's not a big tent you're list. Dra- common and Common and Talib, come on, man. That's that same. Crew. You're drafting Johnny Flynn and Ricky Rubio. <laughs> in the lottery in the same year <laughs> for sure like sh- shoot a better shot than that right there's uh, Takeshi 6 9 is sitting right there for the taking man 
Yeah, I mean, no, no one from down south. <laughs> I mean, Lil Wayne, I will still argue, should be on the top of all these lists, and these lists mean nothing. But I'll at this point, I'll take Lil Wayne over. And this sounds crazy. He's in the conversation with Biggie Smalls and Tupac for me. But also, if you're, did he say Tupac? He didn't say Tupac, did he? No, I said Tupac. No, he did. He did not. Oh. If you're going with Talib and Common, and then you go with Chance, that's like adding Ty Lawson. <laughs> like a third point guard? A triple-headed monster, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I... Oh, does Cordy Booker have uh, roots in Chicago? Is his like aunt from Chicago? Why is two-fifths of his rappers should have been on The Last Dance, but they weren't? He might be. I'm, I'm looking it up right now. Um, do we care about what Cory Booker thinks about rap music? Absolutely not. He's from D.C. Hmm. No go-go. <laughs> well, it's rap, so that's not yeah. really the same thing. But he could have thrown in nonchalant. <laughs> Got a hometown and a woman. Bang, bang. I have not heard, uh, like, thought about nonchalant in like 20 years, man. But it's <laughs> rushing to my brain. Five in the morning, <laughs> oh, my wow. Uh, what a great... Artist name, nonchalant. Nonchalant. Uh, yeah, his list though was, it was kind of what I would have expected. Yeah, it's comforting in that way, right? Um, but yeah, you could have gone with Apache. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is it? Uh, is it? Zanet. Oh, Jane. They're actually not from. Is Fetty Wap from New Jersey? I, I apologize. Yes, that would have been a great one. He's from Patterson. Uh, it's. Red Man? Oh Come on. my Jersey God. Jersey was crushing uh, the best it. MTV cribs of all time. The entire flavor unit <laughs> for the most part. Each member of the unit of flavor, <laughs> man. More flavorful <laughs> than the next. Freddy Fox. I mean New Jersey is pretty real, man. Milk bone. <laughs> Milk bone. The Jersey had a moment. Do all it was that exact era. It was the flavor unit like that. Three or four year span, at New Jersey Drive. Yeah, did you know how all those rappers like who got kind of rich in the '90s all moved to McMansions in New Jersey? Are they all still there? I imagine like them all still wearing FUBU and still being Fat Joe. I would guess that all of those rappers, like from that era, the Diamond D's and Lord <laughs> Finesse's and stuff, who moved to they Jersey, they couldn't afford that. So they could... Diamond D. They could move to Jersey. Jersey's Jersey's not expensive. Well, I was talking about those huge McMansions that we saw on MTP Cribs, right? Like those gated communities. Oh, I don't know if they live in in like Tony Soprano yeah. places with like ducks, <laughs> but I assume all those guys either live it's in New Jersey or duck. they have gone to Atlanta. Mm. Oh yeah, Atlanta. Places with yards and relatively affordable real estate. Mm, that's interesting. Maybe the Carolinas. Not Ohio with Jim Jones and Cameron. No, no, no. There was definitely a pipeline. Remember, Fife did it. Mm. There was a pipeline from New York to Atlanta before Atlanta really became this musical mecca that it has been over the last you know, decade and a half, where New York rappers were going down there. And it was like the place where they would go. The weather was better. It was still, you know, culturally, it was not the same as moving to, say, Texas. It was not the same as moving to Ohio. Mm. It was a thing. Yeah, yeah. I kind of remember this. Um and New York rap has never been the same, to be honest. Shout out to 6 9 who was stirring up some shit on Twitter, at Justin Bieber. Oh. What was that about? It's about some charting stuff. So Bieber, the, the date is wild. Like, Bieber went number one with his new song, and um, Takeshi 6 9 was nipping at the heels. But it turns out Takeshi had like a a lot more streams like significantly more streams because he's popular and uh bieber had more sales but he accused bieber of buying up his own record to push his numbers just collaborate already come on you two i know this is the strategy now to start beef with somebody on twitter and then make a collaboration with them eventually right yeah i like that little uzi vert and cardi uh playboy cardi both said they were going to come out with the album the exact same day. We're kind of beefing, and then neither put something out. <laughs> well played, lads. Hey, it's hard to create content, man. 
but they did everything <laughs> yeah, else. Right. They did the release dates. They did the squabble. They just didn't yeah, do album. Yeah. Actually, even better. Why bother? Could they put them out as one the album? Yeah. Could it just be? Can we have battles about, like, just them battling, just calling each other names? We don't have to play songs anymore. I just want Uzi and Cardi to be on Instagram Live, just making fun of each other. So, question about that, because we're talking about the versus battle series. They've had some interesting ones, like Erica Badu and Jill mm-hmm. Scott. Um, what was the one they had the other day? I missed it. Oh, Nelly against. And Luda. Nelly had some technical issues. <laughs> Uh, but the next one is really exciting yeah. and then it's Beanie Man against Bounty Killer, which is two legends of reggae who are very accustomed to this exact kind of format, like Sound Clash, mm-hmm. Battle. But are they going to make them play like a minute of I don't know songs? how they're going to do this and this is the most interesting one. How is this going to look? Have you been watching any of these? It looks like two people on Instagram. Yeah. And some people have little setups, like Badu. Oh, had, yeah, that was great. I think a projector yeah. behind her and things. And other people look like they're just kind of sitting on a couch. Um, Luda had a mural of his own face behind him. Well, as he should. Nelly, Nelly was on dial-up. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, can we figure this out? We're like 10 weeks into the core. We're years removed from club quarantine. So like, we still haven't figured out a better way to stream this. Apparently not. I've been watching The Voice, uh, and they have been doing live shows um, remotely. You know, every contestant's at home, and all the judges are at their homes. Pretty incredible. They crushed it. They sent everyone boxes, and they created sets, and someone sang Purple Rain from his purple lit porch at night, and it looked amazing. I think there was some dry ice or maybe some smoke machine action. Can we get these for these battles? Like, can Luda get a smoke machine? Yeah. I, th- is, how is the sound quality? Good, but I have suspicions that they maybe recorded it earlier and did live reactions because if something bad happens mm-hmm. with the sound, the whole show crumbles. Yeah, I have not watched enough of them in their entirety to know if... How, how it even works with the sound. Like, are you playing it there and it's just playing into, I don't know, whatever, whatever, whatever. I, I don't even care. I tried to get into it and I just bailed on it immediately. That's how I feel about chloroquine. Life. <laughs> Hydroxychloroquine. I'm like, I, I'm sorry, you saying the Portland Trailblazers? Because I feel very rested right now. <sighs> yeah, sorry. I started talking about, I was thinking audio plugs. Yeah. <laughs> I just honestly just blacked out. I don't even know I heard I someone am. debating about masks in public, and I just like forgot where I was, and I woke up in my bed, and it was the morning. Is that? Are you talking about the devastating injury to the cop on the Portland Trailblazers, who was supposed to be the starting center? Is that count? Uh, guys, sorry, I'm, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's but. Dame Dollar and Obamagate. Oh, I feel so rested. Uh. Amazing. <laughs> Woo! Fresh. Oh, yeah. Jesus. Uh, Rip Van Winkle. Uh, <laughs> Rip Van Winkle City. Uh, so uh, if you had to make... Oh, what's your top five, Ben? Cory Booker, this shit. Give me your top five. Mm. putting you on the spot. Jay-Z. <laughs> Yo. Common. Talib Kweli, Chance the Rapper, and here's a wild, here's a wild card. The Rotten Rest. <laughs> wow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to count them as two. Uh, you know you're saying Quali, Quale, right? Quale, like Squale. Uh, that, mm. I think that's acceptable. Let's change it to Quale from now on. So have you been... Okay, I posted this on Twitter. I've been misspelling simple words in text and saying certain words differently around my friends. Welcome to the club, buddy. <laughs> to see how long it would take my friends to acknowledge it. Oh, well, that's no. not what I've been doing, but now yeah. it is. I just want to know, like, if, like, how much space, it, it, can I keep my friends defensively honest here? How much space would they give me to, like, spe- spell the word, I don't know, like, pizza wrong? Oh, well, because I say things wrong constantly, I would never correct anyone because I would assume that I've been wrong all along. Well, it kind of turns into your own language, right? I watched a Scottish movie the other day and there were subtitles. I remember talking with some Scottish people 
um, when I was overseas once, and I could not understand them at all. Like I think they're from Glasgow. Could not understand I them. I love that language. It is so cool, and you're right. It's hard to follow if you're not used to it, but I think it sounds incredible. Yeah, no commentary on how it sounded. I just could not communicate yep. with someone with a very harsh Glasgow with accent. With slang, like heavy slang. Like they refer to human beings having drinks at a bar in words that I don't understand. Do you know the phrase glassing? No. Apparently, it's a thing in Glasgow, <laughs> and it's made them eliminate glasses from like actual physical glass pint glasses mm -hmm. and they've replaced them with plastic because it was a fighting thing where you would take the cup and you would smash it on someone's face so that the rim would hit someone both in the teeth and on the bridge of their nose that sounds horrifying man that sounds yeah. what do you have to do to get a glassing maybe as an asian person <laughs> i can understand this okay dumb question in Gla in, in glasgow yeah. i have no idea like, look look at someone wrong like mispronounce a word mm. i don't know but apparently it was enough of a problem that people were bashing each other in the face with this technique called glassing that now pint glasses are plastic i'm into that man like which part the, the hitting people in the face with the no pint switching out to things that won't break that aren't weapons mm. <laughs> um but uh, yeah i will say though it really does cut down on the glassings what do you have to do to be glassable it's kind of a glassable Lad, I mean, I, I in Glasgow. I mean, it's right down the name. Is it Glasgow without glassings? No. Do you think bar fights are gonna go down post quar? <laughs> are we nicer? Or are we not as nice? Are we the same? Uh, my theory would be that there'll be more because people will be drunker <laughs> and be more rowdy and unaccustomed to physical space with other people. Being nice doesn't last that long. Be like, I have to be a better person, and I've had a beer. I'm just saying, I think people haven't been around other people. They've had space. Mm. Putting people clustered in a bar, it's going to be more anxiety-causing. Mm. People will be a little bit more on edge. They'll get drunk. They'll get freaked out by someone breathing in their face or something. Oh, my God. That's my An theory. unwanted uh, bar neighbor who just like sidles up to you, that's going to be beef, right? Immediate glass. <laughs> just, just consider yourself glass and just leave the bar. Let's not go through this whole rigmarole of actually glassing someone. Just, I'll, I'll move, I'll move, I'll move to the back. <laughs> uh... Well, so, in happier news than the glassings that are about to occur Horrifying. all over America... It looks like the Knicks are safe. Oh, yeah, this is fantastic. I, I, Mitchell Robinson is now a point guard. Interesting. So if you put Allen Iverson's hands onto his body and Steve Nash's feet. Healed by the Lord's yeah. hands. So Iverson's hands and Steve Nash's feet. Yeah, man. So some clips came out of him working on his crossover step back threes in practice, in quarantine practice. And <laughs> not a lot of social distancing in Mitch's crew, but apparently they're all. Living yeah, together. I'm good with that, man. I I don't know what to do with anything. I'm, I'm not here. To, I'm not. I'm not here to shame. I'm just like yeah, a bunch of dudes playing. It was basketball. like I, maybe six people on the court, one guy filming, uh, whatever. Um, yeah, I hope they're safe. Do I think all those guys live with Mitchell Robinson? <laughs> maybe. maybe he's not making that I'm, much. I'm money, fine with man. that. Oh no, but I'm still. I'm fine with that. Maybe. Mitch, Mitch is making 1.5 million. He can't house a, a posse. As as some his crew cannot float off of that. They're a pod. <laughs> yeah. They're yeah. potting. Uh, but you know, if they're being safe, do your thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. I actually don't really care about that. It is just weird to see people playing basketball. You're like, oh, wait, I know. Basketball. Is this now? Yes. Was Look this? There's a, there's a few of them. When yeah. was this recorded? Yeah, the, my immediate response after seeing the first video last week was like, was this a year ago or was this a week ago? It was a week ago. Um, he looked insane. And, and I would not say he looks like he can run point right off the bat. <laughs> point center. I love it. Some Magic Johnson shit. But here's what I love about it. 
there was some skepticism and, and people sort of made fun of it a little bit because he was wilding out. Yeah, it was awesome. Doing insane crossovers and step backs and he hit a jumper and probably posted it because he made the jumper. But you're watching, you're like, dude, your handle is, is wild. You're a seven foot guy trying to do a zillion Steph Curry moves in 10 seconds. But this was a guy who was, he, he dropped to the second round because people think he didn't really like basketball. <laughs> and to see him clearly enjoying himself on the court and trying things and being into ball, even if it's doing things that may not necessarily translate immediately, I think is a really good sign. That's my takeaway from watching Mitch doing, you know, Allen Iverson yeah. crossovers. This, this guy's into it. He's in, he's into he's into well, ball. To give context to this, people say he didn't like basketball possibly because he skipped going to college. So he was recruited and decided to sit out because he didn't want to risk injury or whatever. He didn't believe the NCAA system, and they they framed him as someone who didn't want it more. And it turns out he wants it as much as anyone else, man, as much as Michael Jordan. That's what I'm saying. The guy wants it. That's yeah. a good sign. A young a young player who is enthusiastic about playing basketball is a good thing. Can, when I saw that video, I was like, can I, can I go here right now? Can I say, <laughs> yo, picking from, in a vacuum, picking from Zion Williamson and Mitchell Robinson, I don't know. I would probably pick Zion, but I would have to think about it, man. Mitchell Robinson is a budding star. The Knicks have made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> you, think, <laughs> you think so? <laughs> oh, I love that team. But all it but all it takes is a couple yes. good moves to salvage things. That's the thing that's quite yes. funny about Yes, Sam Hinkie understood that if you were going to make decisions, you're going to mess them up. So the idea is to have as many cracks as possible. And that even works for teams that do the opposite in terms of making good decisions. You can make bad decision, bad decision, bad decision. But if you make a couple of good ones, you can sort of come through. This is, yeah. And Mitch might be one of those. They got him in the second round. That's found money. And he could be a cornerstone defensively for your team. 1,000%. My whole take is I cannot be upset at the Knicks because it's just they didn't get John Morant because the ping pong ball didn't go their way. If they have John Mitch, we are rolling. But instead, we have RJ Barrett, your boy, and Mitch. And Mitch is there. And, you know, with Sam Hinkie, the thing that I really think about the process is you just have to try to get your hands on a superstar or an all-star level player. And if you can get two, you're rolling. And Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid are exactly what you're looking for. Luckily, they got them. And Mitchell Robinson is exactly what the Knicks are looking for. He's not going to be enough by any stretch of the imagination, but he is what you want, and we have him. And also, look at a team like Denver. You know, they would not have jack shit if they hadn't found Jokic in the second round. Giannis into the Kumpo. Golden State, Golden State would not have won a ring if Draymond Green had not appeared in the second Absolutely. round. Those were oh, players that round, ended yeah. up. Those are guys that are Chris Middleton. These are all guys who, with the exception of Chris Middleton, are likely Hall Did of Fame. Did Manu go in the second, second round? round? Yeah, but that was back in the day, though, when people didn't trust Euros. <laughs> okay. And he, and he couldn't come over True. right away. But, you know, Draymond Green, he was there. Any team in the NBA yeah. could have taken him. They didn't. And that's why you don't sell second-round picks. That's why you, you take all those little chips, whether they're good lottery picks or they're long shots, and you can't rely on getting Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid because if someone else took Joel Embiid and he didn't break his foot, then Philly has Jabari Parker or Marcus Smart instead. Well, yeah. And it's a totally different dynamic for the franchise. I agree with that. Uh, I hedge always on that idea because the players you mentioned are always only like – there's under five in the last like 10 years. You know, We're talking about Jokic, Draymond – now Mitch Robinson and and uh, my oh but I'm yeah. agreeing with you. I'm saying if you have to get a star and it's not you can't just access them. 
So you have to take mm-hmm. shots. You have to try to get them over mm-hmm. and over and over. And it, yeah. And that's second round. I pick. don't think the Philly 76ers should have sold those picks for cash, which is very frustrating. But uh, if you look at the field and you don't like any of those potential guys left over, if there's no Mitchell Robinson left on the board based on your scouting, then selling or trading away that pick, it depends on what you get back. You know, it's like, is... Well, I'm talking specifically about selling second rounders. Yeah. I, I find it one of those practices that is beyond unacceptable for an organization to do and i don't know why the media who follows those teams has not made it unacceptable it, that it's not just an, a scandal when it yeah happens. i i think it's the worst optic thing you should do and you should find that money somewhere else and for we all know this is a business and these are corporations and corporations cut costs all the time but in the nba draft a second round pick if you have one or trade it for another player or trade it for yeah. a future pick. But whatever the case, when you sell a second round pick for two million bucks that doesn't help your cap, it doesn't help your team, it just goes to the owner's yeah. pockets. Like it's fuck annoying. That. Yeah. It's 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 beyond it's beyond unacceptable. And the media sort of reports says, okay, they sold that pick. And like, dude, yeah. raise a I stink. Know. It is garbage. It's absolute garbage. So my my whole thing with the NBA restarting possibly is I <laughs> inexplicably value the draft way way too much but i agree with you every single action during that draft dictates your future and this is it's like you can go into the apple store and grab whatever thing you want but you have 30 seconds i'm like oh these 30 seconds are really important because this could change my whole living situation the draft is so intense that when people say, oh, they just sold the pick, I'm like, well, that's a big error that they should be lambasted for. Or it's like, uh, you know, we got the sixth pick instead of the third pick. I'm like, you should be furious, you know? Like you blew that Trey Young trade with Luka Doncic. Someone should get fired for that. Yeah, I mean, that one, at least they got Trey Young, but I, I agree with you. Trey Young's awesome, and I'm really yeah. Because that one I, I view as a scouting error. Yeah, and I'm not hard on people who make the wrong picks. Yeah, because I'm not yeah. a draft guy, so I'm like, all right, you thought this guy was good, and he ended up yeah. not being good, or you missed that dude because of some reason. Like, all right, there are certainly people who are better scouts than others, but guys, and when I say guys, I mean GMs. They miss picks all the time. People blow picks constantly. But it depends. There's just not. It depends you know. on what kind of miss, though. You, we can't just say it was a miss. Either you draft Nikolai Shishkovili or you underrate Luka Doncic or you hit on Jokic, right? Like, there's more randomness. There's a discussion between randomness and making an error. I think uh, trading away the rights, not drafting Luka Doncic and drafting DeAndre Ayton, I think. You should be on the hot seat for that. Fair. But you're talking about something different mm. than I am. You're talking about making mistakes in player evaluation. Yeah. Like that, that to me just happens. I, I, I don't care. Yeah. Um, I don't get mad. But about isn't that, that um, more egregious than being a bad player on the court? Like uh, mm. drafting, evaluating talent is the foundational aspect of these corporations. And it has more effects than let's say a player slumping for five games right for sure and there are people who are better at evaluating talent than others it seems like but it's also just kind of a crapshoot like look at 2017 faults man lonzo ball kind of awesome jason Tatum, <clears throat> man <laughs> yeah. uh josh jackson De'Aaron fox isaac markinen frankie smokes dennis smith zach collins Malik Monk, Luke Kennard, Donovan Mitchell, you know, you know, Bam Adebayo. Like, there are clear winners out of that group, a couple of them. There are guys or teams who basically didn't benefit, and there are others that were L's. Like, that's top 10. That's top 13, top 14. And my, yeah. And there, there are straight up misses in that And my, my point is they should be held more accountable. Not total, totally accountable, but, you know, 28 teams don't win the championship. And 10 of those bottom teams, their whole front offices, their entire front office is on the hot seat. 
And when you miss a pick, I think you should be considered like to be on that kind of hot seat, right? Well, I mean, other than the fact that Vlade still has a job, <laughs> uh, your boy in Phoenix got canned, probably in part because of the Doncic yeah. pick. Yeah, I mean, uh, the draft I think dictates like when we when we lament when I lament the Knicks. It's because they haven't drafted well, and it's not because they disagree with their picks. They didn't prioritize the the lottery, and that's why um, I'm oddly obsessed with finishing out the season because um, I want the true simulation of the lottery. Except the except the Knicks aren't going to lose a bunch of games. That sucks, and the, I mean, even if you did play it out, the Knicks would probably lose. And ground. there's in terms of picking up and they should be punished for it well like we just have to see the simulation run through um that's my point my thing is saying we played a bunch of veterans to scoop up meaningless wins which gave us less ping pong balls which ultimately ended up with us getting a worse player to me that is like a violation misjudging a, a guy i'm like okay the guy we really like was taken before us we got josh jackson yeah. Hopefully he'll be good. No, he wasn't. Well, it's sort of like I think that shit. Just I agree. Happens. It's sort of like this PPP thing that the government is offering, right? Like, here's complicated, but here's money. Here's uh, forgivable loans to people who um, qualify, and the Knicks are basically the person being like, "I don't really want that." It sounds too complicated, you know? Sure. Like, uh, or it's like the Apple Store thing. It's like, oh, they're giving away iPhones at the Apple Store. And you need a new phone. It's like, but I don't want to walk there. You know, it's like, then that's where the frustration with the Knicks come. It's not that they mess things up on draft day because they hit on draft day. It's that we should have a top three pick and we might get one through the lottery, but chances are we won't. What do you think about the latest in the Knicks front office remake? They've been very active in hiring, I don't know if talent is the word, you know, executives. Mm -hmm. And um, most of them seem to have fairly strong credentials. Since Leon Rose came in to oversee their front office, they kept Scott Perry on, which seems strange to me, but whatever. Mm. Um, and kind of makes me believe that it's... I, I don't know what they're doing with Scott Perry. <laughs> I, mean, I actually just Poor don't Scott Perry, man. I think, is, are they just paying him <laughs> because he's under contract and he doesn't have power? Or is he now surrounded by guys that someone else has hired or is he part of this process who can say but um the knicks went and hired walt perrin from the jazz who is a respect a respected guy he's now going to be i believe the assistant general manager they got uh this guy zanin who was a scout for the thunder and i think he's going to head up their scouting department and then they got the uh, brock eller who was the cap dude from cleveland who's well regarded and the one who pulled his shenanigans to keep them adding talent during LeBron James' uh, championship run era. So it's a new front office for the most part. Are are you optimistic? Uh, I'm happy about it. Uh, Optimistic? Mm, I'm kind of realistic about it. Maybe like uh, shuffling the deck will provide different hands to play. But um, the Knicks have been unsuccessful so long in their front office that you know, I think the, giving these guys a solid like 18, 19, 20 years to do their thing and getting fired after being bad at it. It's like I feel bad people like being replaced, but they're not good. And I don't know if these people are good, but if you hire Leon Rose, which I kind of enjoyed and he wants to bring on his own people like this is just kind of what it is. Right. And he trusts these people. These people are seem very generic and very just NBA people you know who are in the rooms when stuff happened they're not necessarily creative or free thinking as far as i can tell they just seem like company men whatever sure you know like um i don't believe in front office culture so uh until they get somebody that we can identify as a forward thinker maybe that is leon rose like whatever i'm cool with it it sounds fine when you say you don't believe in Front office culture, what do you mean? Um, I believe that success and failure in the front office is more complicated than just like win losses, wins and losses on the court. And I don't think somebody who is whatever you think culturally would 
add to a team. Uh, I don't think you can do anything without actually acquiring good basketball players. Mm, but see, I think the whole point of a front office is front office culture. And it's not about wins and losses, at least, you know, not initially or maybe ever really. But then your front office would cease to exist if that didn't come as a su uh, subsequent you know, counter effect mm -hmm. of it. But I think if you look at Houston, you looked at Philly under Hinky, you look at the Knicks up until recently, we'll see. Uh, there are distinct front office cultures. The Lakers, they have a front office culture. And it doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> it was good until it wasn't good, right? But, like, but I'm saying the Knicks had a distinct bad front office culture, and they have for uh, two oh, decades. I... They've, made, they've made bad decisions, then they got Donnie That's Walsh, not culture. And That's changed just bad, the culture. Right? But isn't that what we're talking about, though? I mean, then culture just... I mean, my whole thing is uh, sports culture doesn't exist. Like, wouldn't we say that... But wouldn't we say that Daryl Morey and Houston has a front office culture? We would, but I think I most think, people would say they have a bad culture because they never win. Uh, well, I'm not talking about what most people would say. I'm saying... I mean, culture such a... I think yeah. when you hire good people and you push, say, sports science and metrics and progressive thought and new ideas... Like that becomes the culture, oh. and it's based on the people. But it's it's a it's a top down ideology. The Warriors or, um, you know, the Wizards now seem to have adopted more of that that style. But the Knicks and the Lakers don't seem to. They seem to kind of have their own culture, which is still like old guard. Yeah, I I view that less as culture. I know what you mean. Uh, I I view that less as culture and more just people who are bad at their jobs who have been there for a while. Like Maury could leave and then um, someone else could replace him. Like um, Steve Mills could replace him and then the culture is all of a sudden bad. And uh, what got me thinking with on this track was the Cleveland Cavaliers franchise and their buffoons over there. And they lucked out on LeBron James and won a championship. They, like, they messed around and won it all. And I think he left and they're still buffoons. And... They get to hang a banner, um, and I think, I think you know what you what you're saying is true. I think someone like Daryl Morey and Sam Hinkie and smart teams, Donnie Walsh. If we're talking about the Last Dance, like they had a vision and they carried through to that vision with hirings in the front office, the way they conduct business, and the resources they tap into to create teams. To me, that's Donnie Walsh, that's Daryl Morey, and that's Sam Hinkie. Yeah, I'm even talking about, say, under Rob Hannigan in Orlando. They decided they were going to get heavily into metrics. They sent more representatives to Sloan than any other NBA team. They clearly were progressive in many, many ways. They ended up not being successful. Mm -hmm. But they, they were trying to institute a culture. Does not mean you're going to do well. Doesn't mean you're going to make the right decisions ultimately. But that's kind of what I mean by culture. There was an outlook. There was a point of view. And the Knicks... And Lakers seem to have a different style than that. It's we're a big market, we're a marquee franchise, we're going to get stars yeah. because of who yeah. we are. And that's been the Knicks' culture in their front office for a long time. And in the Nets, it was very much this, you know, wanton spending of money under Russian oligarchs that got totally flipped to now being, oh, we're smart. We're a, we're a smart, progressive, data driven front office like the Spurs. And they changed kind of the culture of their front office when Sean Marks came in. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Um, I mean, I, I'm really just using it as a euphemism for like perspective. Yeah, and 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 how that trickles yeah. down from whoever's running the the front and office. And I always think of like a lame analogy would be like a toolbox. If you had a, all the the best screwdrivers money can buy, and then here comes a power drill, and the power drill changes everything. It speeds things up. It's more efficient. You can get more work done. And then the power drill breaks or you lose it and you're back to the, the screwdrivers. The toolbox is the same. It's been the same the whole time. The power drill is what made the difference. The culture of the toolbox did not change. Yeah, we're kind of saying the same thing. But in a place like San Antonio they've had this same culture for decades, basically. 
and it's because they've had the same people RC Buford. running. Yeah. And then they right Buford and, and mm-hmm. Popovich, and then they hire people who become steeped in that culture and orthodoxy, and then go elsewhere, like Brett yeah. Brown or Steve Kerr. You know, they're not always successful yeah. where they go, but it is like an approach, and it's like okay, we're about work and cult. I mean, they say culture constantly. Yeah, it's of like course so they annoying. do. Um, but. I mean, Miami culture, 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 Sixers, culture, culture, Spurs. They all say that I mean, shit, ver- like that exact phrase more than the media. I, I would, I would push against uh, San Antonio entirely. And remember, we were debating the Kawhi, Kawhi leaving because he was mad at Pop. I'm like, that doesn't seem like good culture at all. And our whole argument was, or my whole argument was, the culture doesn't exist without Tim Duncan. And Tim Duncan is was such a good player and a, such a distinct personality that R.C. Buford was allowed to say culture because Duncan kind of led by example, and he was a top NBA talent of all time that they got as a rookie who stayed in San Antonio. And before Duncan, Popovich was on the hot seat, and he was looked at as, as a coach who was a little too military and old school and boomer. And Duncan changed Popovich, and Popovich transformed with Duncan until you get to Kawhi Leonard, who was like, I don't like these guys. I'm out. And then Kawhi Leonard wins championships in other places. And it... Yeah, I don't think that had anything to do with him liking I don't know, right? And and I remember us roasting the whole idea of Popovich being like a, a player whisperer. Because apparently... All of a sudden, he wasn't, and we'll never know why he was and why he wasn't. We, but we, I mean, we we know. Why. Yeah, for sure. And and like it, it had nothing to do with the Spurs. <laughs> you know, nothing. I mean, I mean, what vacuum are we setting up? Like, we're just setting up like satellite multi the multi vacuum verse, right? Uh, in this vacuum, culturally, they're sound. In another vacuum, they haven't. They've gotten worse progressively as after they've lost Duncan, and. Uh, it depends on where you come into the conversation because... But we know what the Spurs stand for, though, right? And again, this is not saying mm. this is a winning recipe even when right. it's not. When you don't have the players, yeah. it doesn't work. But we know what they do, right? We know they were all about foreign players. We know they're all about finding guys and develop, developing them under their system. The Jonathan Simmons type of guys. The Burchons guys. They were... They're super into, like, di- as you said, discipline yeah. and that kind of shit. Yeah, and they have a point of view, and the, the Knicks certainly Anal- have a point of anal- view. Analytics, yeah. sports science, they're very secretive. Yeah. At, at um, this point, like... I mean, I'm just saying, there's a, there's a reason that they work in tandem, right? Where if you get a Tim Duncan and he stays, then you can build this organization. If he leaves, maybe you don't have a, a chance to establish this, this whole orthodoxy. Yeah, and I think the Knicks losing out on John ja Morant, or even Zion, if you want to throw him in there cost Fisdale his job, cost Mills his office. He has to move next door. Uh, <laughs> um, and we talk about culture in a clear sense, and I think that's legitimate. And uh, when when people bring up culture, I get it right away. I'm not trying to brush against it. I just don't think it is as important to me as getting Zion Williamson. Of course, it comes down to players first. But what I'm saying is the Knicks said stuff about culture. I mean, but we know what their outlook yeah. is. Their outlook doesn't frame up nope. that at all. They, they they said that same word last off season. I mean, front offices have no not many words to use, right? Hundred <laughs> percent. Every front office says we're trying to establish yeah. a culture. Our our culture is about hard work. <laughs> <laughs> like, what if <laughs> what, what, what what organization wouldn't the say Lakers that? being like? <laughs> we're we're fancy, man. Hollywood. Our thing's about slam dunks, <laughs> slamming and jamming. <laughs> no, it passes. Uh, <laughs> we're not. We don't really practice. We expensive cars. Yeah. We like driving those. Um, sunshine, Hollywood. <laughs> Isn't it bit. interesting that in the last dance we didn't get the c word at all? Yeah, because but, it was all about winning, man. It was just results. So introducing the C word would give Horace Grant credit. But also because those guys are too old for culture. That's true. That's true. It didn't, it didn't arise as a catchphrase until maybe the last six years ago in basketball. That's fair. That's fair. It was not a, it was not a Shout out to word. Tony Roten. Trust the process. What they were really into was wellness. <laughs> no, apparently. 
being present. Yeah, present hoarding pizza, poison pizza. <laughs> so there's been a little fallout from your favorite documentary, Loved The Last it. Dance. Uh, some of the kings who were dragged through the mud by Michael Jordan in his personal <laughs> vendetta fest. Yeah. It was like Taken uh, Scott- starring Michael Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> So in the mm, Michael Jordan's evening some scores <laughs> against his <laughs> beloved former teammates. <laughs> Revenge best served in a 10-episode yeah. documentary on just, ESPN 20 years after the just fact. Just assassinating uh, reputations like Mark Wahlberg and Sniper. So Scotty Pippen, who Michael Jordan takes pains to say was the best player he ever had as a teammate. He really makes that clear. The best guy I have ever had was Pippen. And then he goes on to dismantle Pippen for the rest of the documentary, leading one to say, wow, the guy that Michael Jordan had with him, you couldn't rely on at all. He was always hurt. He was always migrating it up. He wanted to be an alpha, but was clearly a beta, kind of a bitch. He wanted money. So what our takeaway was, was that, the best player that Michael Jordan ever had kind of wasn't. Yeah, shit. that's the takeaway. If that was the point, if you weren't a su- su- uber basketball fan and apex hoop hoop fan, the takeaway is like, oh, Pippen was a really suspect. He had it all, but he needed he needed Jordan to bring it out of him because he didn't even want to check into a game. Just sus as hell. Yeah. Are you sus if you don't want to check into a game? I don't know, but getting on the court means you're closer to like nine dudes. <laughs> yeah, true. That's pretty true. sus. But then you're sitting on the bench, whatever. Um, but you might touch a ball. Oh, yeah. Mm, sus. sus. A spherical object. So, yeah. Pi- so, Pippin apparently is not happy about his portrayal as a bitch in The Last Dance. Because he... I, I'm not using that as yeah, a, I don't love that like a derogatory way like myself. But I'm saying he was being... That's how he was portrayed. He was portrayed as someone who didn't want it enough. And I do not know why in The Last Dance there was an elongated segment about the year Jordan wasn't on the team just to roast we, Scottie Pippen. I, all it was was to show that Scottie Pippen couldn't carry that team by himself and that he was not an actual alpha that he was a beta and Phil Jackson knew it and everyone else knew it. That even when MJ was gone and people talked about Scotty being an MVP candidate, when push came to shove, Phil knew. Phil knew. Couldn't give the ball to Scotty. Would you ever have taken that ball out of Michael Jordan's hands? Not ever. And I feel like Pippen had kind of one of the capping moments in the documentary when he was like, well, I have much to be grateful for. I played with the greatest player of all time, the greatest coach of all time, and the greatest GM of all time. And I was like, well, Scotty is an advanced human. Like, he is more mature than certainly Michael Jordan is, and I'm surprised they even let him say that Jerry Krause was the best GM of all time. Um, But Jordan really wanted him to say, like, oh, I owe it all to MJ. I mean, the documentary is pretty shameful. In a joyous way. Fun yeah. to watch, fun stuff, but just a shameful, a shameful documentary. If your friend did that to you, I would text them and be like, are we good? What is happening? What? I mean, Michael, Michael Jordan sucks. Yeah, I don't want to hang with him. He's the worst dude. Really good basketball player. There's no, like, to do a documentary... Your, of your life's work and to make Scottie Pippen look bad? It's weird. It's that's, weird. That's, that's just yeah. gross. It's just gross. And like, you know, Horace left the team and all, but to like erase the clips of Horace Grant blocking the final shot in the 95 yeah. playoffs or 95 finals against Phoenix to just not show that clip? Insane. Yeah. Utterly and- insane. And, and Horace is another guy right. who came out and said that MJ is a liar and he's a snitch. And Horace has been the real talk for this entire process. Whenever he comes on screen, he's the only real talk. And he said that a lot of this stuff was edited out, obviously. And he dropped a cash me outside. He was like, yo, if Jordan has a problem with me, you know where to find me. <laughs> Which I thought was very boomer. And I'm sure boomers love that. But 
it's it's the boomer's paradox because they want to prop Jordan up as the apex, but Horace Grant is like, fight me. <laughs> I'm thinking about becoming a hard ass <laughs> online. Who, I support this. Who thinks everything that Michael Jordan does is awesome <laughs> and that anybody who takes issue with his hateful behavior or his horrific leadership oh style God. is basically a baby <laughs> who wants a participation trophy and has been shoved in lockers. That's going to be my new kind of persona, like hard ass cult of joy. You're going to, I'm looking you're forward to emerge from the core being a hard ass on Twitter. <laughs> you despise, despise it, man. Well, yeah. The reason that you think Michael Jordan being, cruel to his teammates is wrong is because you're a baby <laughs> and you don't know how to lead. Yeah, I mean, yes. <laughs> Dude, I'm yeah, a hard ass. I believe <laughs> it, man. You catch these catch these hands, man. Um like oh, Horace just threatened to um fight Michael. That's because uh Michael's too much of a winner to fight Horace. Right. <laughs> uh not because Horace would uh yeah. Beat the shit out of him. And, and you know, last week when we had, or Monday when we had the, the last dance kind of uh, finale rundown. The last tango for yeah. the last dance, yes. The Lance dance. There's the guitar move. <laughs> There's, I think, blowing in LeBron's ear is also kind of dance. Lance will make the dance. <laughs> yep. Um, but, you know, we were saying that this has a potential and probability to be like the the peak of... Uh, sociopath athlete worship culture and we got 10 hours of explicitly that and it wasn't quite convincing so you know whereas before I get caught up in a lot of reply stuff I like to read it when if ESPN posts something being like Jordan's a goat or like Horace Grant says something and they post that just reading the replies I got to say the tide is turning to LeBron a little bit. People are like, Yo, why is MJ this way? What was that documentary all about? And then every other uh, every other response is, you know, tough guy, your new persona, which is like, because he's the GOAT and you can't handle it. Um, so I think Michael Jordan is a bona fide sociopath. That's fine. Yeah. I, I think I, he I, is. Yeah. And, and I'm not just using it in the way that it gets overused, like, Oh, my ex girlfriend, what a sociopath. Ex boyfriend. Oh, yeah. That dude. You, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like anybody's, anybody who you're annoyed by the behavior of, you can call them a narcissist or a sociopath. Overused, for sure. And I'm saying, I think Michael Jordan may be legitimately those things. He's a dark triad ass dude. Yeah, he's dark, for sure. And when you see him being charming, it also fits into that. That he can go from being this just punishingly cruel person to immediately meeting someone and being so charming and funny, like that fits into that, that character profile. And so his leadership style, this whole documentary, everything falls into that, which is interesting. But it kind of made me think about Kobe and how much we called him a sociopath. I think Kobe was cosplaying as Jordan and adopted all these traits that we were seeing celebrated by the hard asses of Twitter. Yeah, and... I mean, I could be wrong. Kobe might have been a sociopath, but I feel like he heard all this lore and just adopted it and decided that that's who I am. I am a Jordan sociopath. And it's seductive, right? Because then you, you're putting yourself at an elite level. And, you know, if you apply that idea to a workplace, like if the person's really good, this is the Peter Luger thing again. If the person's really good, but they're a bad teammate and they're kind of not likable then then they have to be excellent um and alonzo trier on the knicks always talks about you know he's his nickname is iso zo and he has a, a bit of kobe in him where you know, give me the rock you know like i trust myself and no one else and he's just not as good as these two guys were in kobe bryant and michael jordan are top 30 basketball players of all time i mean look Trier's right there with Kobe. Same same category. Mm -hmm. Iso Kobe. Yeah. Sorry. Anyway, it's no. I hear what you're saying, and it's that these are just ends justify the means, mm -hmm. guys. You're right. 
they worked harder. And I'm saying, I'm saying that Kobe adopted these qualities from Jordan because he duplicated everything from Jordan, his entire style of play, everything, the way he, the way he talks. He took everything from Jordan because Jordan was the greatest and he wanted to be like him. So these personality traits that we see in Jordan say, well, he's a psycho. Kobe's like, this is how you win. This is how you become the best, by being mm-hmm. a psycho. And being a jerk and tough love. Yeah. I think Kobe was like socialized by Jordan into being like a carbon copy sociopath versus naturally being one. I don't know that Kobe would have just been that guy if not for Michael Jordan's influence. Michael Jordan's influence, and you know, we've talked about this with the, the dunk contest with Dominique. His actual productivity is dwarfed by his influence. And you're right. Like, there is no, and Kobe said it himself on the documentary, there is no Kobe without Michael. And I think it's so interesting because somebody recently t- uh, said to me that Michael had to be this way in order to succeed, in order to win. He had to channel this part of his personality to um, perform. Which is interesting because I think that's a unique discussion for a person and not uh, an athlete because, you know, the BMM would easily say, well, if you really wanted to transcend just being a player to a champion, you have to be like Bill Russell, who was socially aware, who was an activist, who was a good teammate. And Jordan was none of those things, but he succeeded to a comparable level and LeBron is none of those things and he succeeded to a comparable level we just have to wait for this sociopath mentality that originated with Jordan to die out right it's going to die out well that's what I'm saying is that Kobe the mama mentality is a, a, a version of the Jordan will to win it's the same mythos and there will be other players who come along who adopt that But I think you'll see less and less because the generations have changed. I don't think Zoomers and Millennials feel that same way overall. And when you think about where Michael Jordan came from, that, you know, he arrived in the 80s. He grew up in the 70s. That was so long ago. So long ago. You know, he was playing basketball, like, as a teen in the 70s. It's just a very stark difference from someone who grew up in like 2015 and i want to get into this as like a lead lead pod topic um because what you're suggesting is like is correct and it's a huge broader cultural thing and i think there's a lot of elements that go into how michael jordan came to be and you know this has been our beef with the entire documentary Tell us how he came to be. The 70s were crucial to his development because he was a young man learning how to play basketball, sort of like Kobe Bryant was a young man watching Jordan play. I mean, he was he was 15 years old in like the late 70s. Just a different time period altogether, like Vietnam War and shit. Yeah. He was born in 1963. I would have no problems with the last dance starting at the Vietnam War (laughs) and a young Michael Jordan. That's because you're that's because you're creative. (laughs) No, but like, I want, he has to talk about Dr. J, right? He must have some Dr. J feelings. He he mentioned him. They were, that was in the doc. Oh, that's nice. Hmm. Wow. (laughs) Looks like someone wasn't, was asleep at the switch. I heard them mention Mo Cheeks and just the proximity (laughs) to the Blazers made me pass out. No, I think he said Dr. J was his hero. But we want more of that, right? Or, uh, well, let's talk about Dr. J then paint the Dr. J picture for me, you know? Um, But I think all the things that we wanted from Jordan uh, can't be had. And we accept the terms of Jordan's usage. And as fans, we get what we get from him and which makes him so fascinating. Um, And there's, there's so many misleading parts of this documentary. Like the LeBradford Smith thing was nothing. That was a story about a lie Michael Jordan told himself. No one cared about that. No one cared about LeBradford Smith. The confrontation never happened. But it, it's supposed to paint a picture of him as being a self-motivating creature. But instead, it paints a picture of him being spiteful. 
I don't even know if it was spiteful. It was more just weird. Pretty weird. Like, why bring up LeBradford Smith? <laughs> well, I mean, him doing that entire bullshit and inventing a story of Le Bradford Smith saying nice game or <laughs> yeah. something like that as he walked off and he that was enough for Le, him to torture him the next time <laughs> around. You got the best of LB, LBS. <laughs> what was so goofy about that story was that why would you make that up instead of just saying Le Bradford Smith had a good game against me so I wanted to like get him back. Yeah, I don't know. Why, why would you introduce this thing of him taunting you but to make it more morally superior to make it like I don't even understand the, the point of the the lie. Why not just say Jordan was off this little known guy named Le Bradford Smith had a good game the next time Jordan went against him. him you know he, he just thrashed yeah. him a good old fashioned thrash. <laughs> um, I agree. And to hear this reaction come out, and I think we're going to hear from eventually more and more players. Isaiah has come out saying, what the hell? <laughs> uh, why Why am I such a big part of this story? Like, we know what happened. I wish I was part of the dream team. Okay, I'm not, you know? MJ, why are you such a big, dumb liar? <laughs> uh, what's going on with that? What's the, what's the whole, what are the lies about? <laughs> I mean, people have been making top, top five lists of lies, I think, uh, I saw a couple funny ones, like the pizza thing. It was just like, it just sounds like a lie. And I don't want to believe in conspiracy theory. But it, when someone's like, oh, I eat whole pizzas by myself all the time. I actually spit on pizzas because I don't want anyone to eat them. I'm like, this seems like a lot of work for something we don't actually care about. Just say you had the flu, dog. And number five, Queen Latifah. I don't even remember her being in the doc. <laughs> uh, but yes, the pizza story. So the... A guy who claims to be one of the delivery men who lived in Utah and took the pizza over to the hotel that Michael Jordan ate, he went on a radio show and disputes any idea that it was A, poisoned, <laughs> <laughs> or B, that it was even food poisoned, let alone pooped upon. <laughs> and he says that he was, in fact, a Chicago Bulls fan. So when the order came in and someone said it might be a player, he said, for the Bulls, he claims, I'll, I, he said, I would make it myself. I'm not letting you guys make something that's for the Bulls. I'll make it myself. So he said he made it. It was He claimed it was a, I don't know, something crispy crust. So he worked for Pizza Hut. Uh, double pepperoni pizza. That was what he says it was. And he said it never left his hands. And he, he made it himself. And he took it. And he said there was only one guy with him, and not five. Took it over to MJ's place. Handed it to someone in the door of the hotel room and he said can I see Michael and, they, and he claims they cracked the door open Michael said hey thanks man and waved then they closed the door and he left and he's like that there was no other reports of anyone getting sick for any other pizza that went out from there and there was nothing on it that even would have made someone sick and that he did it all himself so he is firmly if telling the truth refuting the idea that this was poisoning or inadvertent poisoning i mean uh i think it reminds me of the way donald trump talks about the coronavirus right it's like i don't see it for me and if it happens it's someone else's fault i'm like it could have been everything like the way we understand the stomach flu is like guessing all the time if you come down with a stomach flu tonight it's like well it's because of the last thing i ate it's like i don't know you could have like touched a handle wiped your mouth off with the same hand i we have no idea it could have been the box i know right now that we know so much about about hand washing yeah. and breathing what are we f freaking out about that it had to be like a pooped upon yeah. pepperoni yeah. it or it was oh he just got really drunk and was super hung over like, no none of those things have to be that he could have just got a virus off of some yeah. shit could have gotten some bacteria. Dude, he was in a hotel room. Like, who knows? Like, we all know that those places. He touched the remote control in the hotel room with fecal matter on it. Paul Pierce. And then he put and then he put the poop right into his own <laughs> yeah, eye. Totally. It could have been everything. And, I mean, I love the color of the pizza story. That's great. But we didn't get enough of it for it to not seem like a joke. <laughs> it's like there was five guys. I'm like, what? Can we hear from one of these guys? Was it from Pizza Hut? You know, like, and how could... 
and now this guy is saying two guys pizza yeah. hut why did the hotel let five guys up why didn't they just drop it off at the concierge and have someone else bring it up to michael jordan <laughs> you know like you know who's in that room um none of it, it makes just sense. makes no sense and ordering pizza in utah mm. that is particularly senseless at least get like you know a bunch of luger sticks for the lads <laughs> what is the the cuisine the specialty cuisine in salt lake city it's beef, right? I don't know, but let's... It's, it's burger country. Steaks? Yeah, it's probably Luger's. Can you get Luger's shipped across the country? Do they do that now? Mm, I know Katz does know. that. I know some steak places do. I don't know about Luger's, though. Because they... Eh, they might. I know they do all their like dry aging themselves. Yeah, and they won't tell you how they do it. <laughs> we leave it out. The secret, the, the secret states. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll just have to get some orders and reverse engineer them in our steak lab. Mm, it's like a, a cookies bungalow. Getting a bunch of steaks. I like it. I love cookies. Do it. Um, so anyway, yes. Again, if you were hearing this on Monday of next week, it's because you're not listening on Patreon. Yes. And again, thank you to everyone from Patreon who has signed up and we're excited to keep giving you first access to all these delightful pods and gear and some discounts. We love to see it. You love to see it. Cookies. Cookies.